kings offering their sons as sacrifices to God, which was an abomination to God. Archaeology also has uncovered um, remains where sacrifices of children took place. And not only in that particular part of the country, but also a number of places throughout the world, especially in South America and Central America. But the point is that Abraham was being asked to do something that was repulsive to him and was something that he thought was wrong. He did not buy into that pagan practice. And plus, this was the promised son. He waited years and years for this son to be born according to promise. As a matter of fact, a year early, uh, a year before he was born, an angel told him, in one year, Sarah will be born. And you remember what Sarah did. She laughed because she was almost 100 years old. Can you imagine conceiving at 100 years old, ladies? Even if you could, you wouldn't, right? Obviously, that was a miracle in fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that he would be given an heir. And so a year later, Sarah gave birth to this child. He loved this child. He grew up to be obviously a very obedient child. Twice it said Abraham's son was the son whom he loved, his only son. So one day he got a message from God. You must do this, Abraham. I could think of a million reasons how I could try to get out of that. The first one was, what did I eat last night? That was certainly a nightmare. I was told to offer my son upon the altar. No, he knew exactly the voice of God. He had heard it before. That's why he left the Kuwait area and went all the way around the Fertile Crescent into the Promised Land to a land that God would show him because God says, get out of your country from your kindred to a land I will show you and I will give you that land. And he obeyed and God fulfilled his promise. So he had heard that voice before and he obeyed. But obviously we understand that if Abraham did that on his own, if he said one morning, you know, I'm going to prove God that I fear him. And I'll just show God just how much I honor him and I'm going to sacrifice my child with no commandment of God. That would be murder, wouldn't it? That would be murder. And no amount of religion would justify the act of taking human life. So the first thing that we learn about worship is that it must be based upon the revelation of God, not upon man's whim. Not upon guess, not upon tradition. The Bible talks about several types of worship. There's vain worship in Matthew 15, verse 19. In vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrine the precepts of men, says Jesus. And so he said people of his day were worshiping vain, they were offering vain worship because it wasn't authorized by God. And furthermore, we find that in Acts 17, 23, Paul said that the Athenian Greek, uh, Greeks were worshiping idols. And he says, you are worshiping God ignorantly. What you worship ignorantly, let me set forth the truth to you. In John 4 and verse 22, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, what you worship, you worship in ignorance. And so we find Paul and Jesus agreeing that there is ignorant worship. Worship not based upon knowledge and understanding. In Colossians 2 and verse 23, Paul condemns what the older translations rightfully render it, will worship. Will worship is, according to W. Vine, the renowned Greek scholar, voluntary adopted worship, whether unbidden or forbidden. In other words, doing what's not authorized 
or doing what's condemned is will worship. Worship based upon one's own will rather than revelation. And then there's true worship, John 4, 23 and 24, that is according to the spirit and truth. True worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. So Abraham had a revelation from God to do this act of worship. He called it, we will go there and worship. But it will be based upon God's word. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, all things that pertain to godliness, life and godliness has been revealed to us through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's been revealed. And so if we do not have a thus saith the Lord for all that we practice in worship, we should ask ourselves the question, why are we doing that? Are we being presumptuous? And complement this lesson with my article in the bulletin, please. The second point is that worship is conditioned by faith in an obedience to the divine word. Abraham's response was unquestioning, prompt and full. In Hebrews 11, verse 17, he is listed in those heroes of faith because he obeyed God's command in offering his son Isaac. He did something in response to God's word. In our case, we must worship in spirit and in truth. The act and act with a heart full of faith. And an act without the heart is worthless, as Jesus says in Matthew 7 and verse 6. Thirdly, worship involves a costly presentation to God. What if Abraham said, Lord, I got a good looking lamb out there I'd like to share with you. Won't you just accept that? After all, you know, that's a good-looking lamb. And you used to accept lambs. So why don't you accept that lamb and substitute for my son? No. In Abraham's case, his only and well-beloved son, it says twice, whom you love. It cost him to trust and obey God. It costs him sacrifice. In our case, Hebrews 13 and verse 15, a beautiful verse of scripture, through him, Jesus, let us continually offer, us, offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that gives thanks to his name. You know, in this day and age, being spectators is, is really a contagious thing. You know, people like to go to the sporting events and they want to be spectators. They want to watch their children, their sons, their friends, or they just their favorite team. They will spend a fortune to go and sit and, and watch. And so we become spectators by, by just living in this society today. Unfortunately, that kind of overflows into our worship service. And we become spectators in worship rather than participants. We listen to others sing that, and while we don't sing. Um, and so we, we listen, but we don't listen to obey. We listen just simply out of curiosity or just because we have to, because we're here. Or do we put our all into it? You must worship in spirit and in truth. It's not the truth by itself, but the spirit as well. The whole being must take part in this expression of worship, and we've got to understand there's some sacrifice that we must make. Sacrifice in time. Sacrifice of opportunity. Sacrifice of talent. Sacrifice of money. Of, um, of our abilities. We need to be willing to give something to God because he's given so much to us. And so when we think about how little time we spend in worship, 
Now, just count the time, the hours during the week, when you come together in collective worship. And, and you think about all the hours there is in a day, in a week, in a month, and in a year. And then we start adding up the hours that we spent in worshiping God and serving the Lord in worship and praise. Do you consider that really sacrifice? Do you? I don't. It's certainly not enough. And so... Isn't it humbling to realize how little we do give? And yet God continues to give. James 1, every gift, every good and perfect gift has come down from our Father in heaven who gives abundantly. Is no, uh, he doesn't do it grudgingly. James 1, verse 18. The fourth thing that I want to share with you, and this is very important. In verse 5, you notice he brought two servants with him. They came to a certain point after three days, and he saw the place where God pointed out to him, that's the mountain, Mount Moriah, where you offer that sacrifice. He stopped, and he said to the young men, you stay here. We will go there and worship and come back to you. In Abraham's case, you can see there was a deliberate separation from these men who possibly could have obstructed his plans, hindered him, stopped him from trying to go through and carrying out the command of the Lord. These young men could have attacked this old man that was 100 years old and rescued Isaac. And so Abraham, realizing this, realized that he had to separate himself from anything that would hinder him from worshiping God according to his word. You see the point that I'm trying to make? Diversions of mind, planning, weakness of the flesh, all come into play here. That, you know, ladies, forget about your roast in the oven. Men, forget about the roast in the oven. Let's just focus upon what we're doing right now. And if there's, you know, if you're constantly thinking about your cell phone and the messages and the texts that you're going to get or are getting, if that's an obstruction, if that is a diversion, then why don't you leave it in the car or leave it at home? Can't we just devote an hour without any distractions from the outside world? Abraham says, you stay here. That means anything that obstructs my worship. You stay there. And so we have in Hebrews 10, 22, having a high priest, Jesus, over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And so the believer needs to ascend the mountain as Abraham and leave the mundane things of earth below. As the poet says, shut in with God far, far above the restless world that wars below. My next point. Worship requires absolute renunciation of self. Abraham knew what this worship on this occasion required. There is nothing self-centered, man-centered in his worship. There wasn't a thought about himself. There wasn't a thought of what he might get out of it. He was honoring God. That's all that matters. Today, people go where they can get the greatest entertainment, the biggest thrill that they can obtain. And... The bigger the church, the better for many. Thinking about themselves. Expressing the narcissistic characteristics of this generation. We need to be more like Abraham. Where we center our worship in God. Rather than thinking about what I'm going to get out of this. 
In Philippians 3 and verse 3, we worship God in spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And so, number six, worship glorifies God. In 16 and 18, we discover here, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. God was glorified in the heart and mind of Abraham, and because of that, God would bless Abraham. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. When we leave here, what do we think about? Do we think, God, have you been glorified? Or do we think, I'm glad that's over with. He went over today. Spoke a little long. Well... Let's not think about those things, okay? Let's think about the fact that we're here to give God the glory for saving us from our sins and, and saving us from eternal damnation and to guide us in our lives and using us to his glory and to the betterment of this world. And so God is to receive the glory. And finally, worship results in blessings to the worshiper. Abraham had a renewal of God's promise to bless him. And one of the greatest blessings he had when he came down from that mountain was a greater appreciation for his son that was still alive. What a great blessing. We too must understand that God will reward us and bless us richly if we Worship him in spirit and in truth. We renew God's promises. We're reminded what the Lord's Supper is really all about. It is God came down to this world to die to bless us. To enrich us. And so in essence then, when we slip off away from the world and slip into this haven for worship. It's a time for us to free our minds from our troubles and our heartaches and for a moment of time to have a connection with our God and our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ where there will be greater appreciation of his blessings of one another and especially of Jesus and his son. So the great question is, what is our focus? Do we understand these points? I'm going to give them to you once more. Worship must be based upon revelation from God. Worship is conditioned by faith in and obedience to his divine word. Worship involves a costly presentation to God. It requires a deliberate separation for God. Worship demands absolute renunciation of self. Worship glorifies God, and it results in blessings to the worshiper. <clears throat> There's a story to the effect that a certain society in South Africa once wrote to David Livingston, the first, uh, the first missionary to Africa. Have you found a good road? To where you are. If so, we want to send other men to join you. Livingston re replied, If you have men who will only come if they know there is a good road, I do not want them. If we're looking for an easy path to eternity, God doesn't want us. He wants us to take up our cross and follow him.
that cross that you have is different from mine, but it's never less a cross. It's a burden, yes, but we should look upon it as a cross and not a burden. We're going to offer this invitation. You may need to respond for various reasons to share a spiritual need to rededicate your life to the Lord Jesus, to be baptized, to declare your faith in the Lord Jesus, whatever your need might be. We're here to assist you. Please come as we stand and as we sing.